Welcome to Legion Radio, a podcast about all things e-commerce. The official podcast of the Private Label Legion, hosted by Tim Jordan. Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Legion Radio, the official podcast of the Private Label Legion community. Today I'm bringing you another guest, Rich Goldstein. Rich is somebody that I met um, fairly recently, we'll talk about that in a second, and he's going to be bringing us all sorts of cool information, not just regarding like intellectual property rights, but also how you can use some of those resources to find potential product ideas, which is super cool. If you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button here on the YouTube channel. If you're listening on Podbean or iTunes or wherever else you're listening, uh, make sure to subscribe to this channel so you get notifications of new episodes coming out. Check us out on privatelabellegion.com and or hickory-flats.com. We've got a lot of free content, a lot of cool stuff going on there. Make sure to check out those websites to see all that stuff. So Rich, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tim. So where was it that we met? I can't actually remember. I think that we met at like maybe SellerCon briefly. Yeah, I think we did. It all kind of blurs into one. I've been to so many seller events this year, so many Amazon events this year that, uh, yeah, um, one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, if I remember right, um, you and Steve Simonson were throwing some sort of get together at SellerCon that I rolled through. And then I was supposed to catch up with you and then I never did because I'm really, really bad about responding to Facebook messages. But then I think I saw you again at Kevin King's event, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, I've been at all of those places. And um, at Celicon, I did. I had a, a pretty big party at the MGM Sky Suites with um, Steve Simonson um, and his Empowery group. And uh, that was lots of fun. And uh, um, if I don't remember you being there, it's probably because there was like 100 people there in our suite. It was a big suite, but still a lot of people and a lot of fun. Well, I don't think we even talked. I think you just followed up later. You're like, hey, Tim, I think you came to my party. We should talk. And then that's where I ghosted you. So uh, thank right, goodness right. for Kevin King's event there in Austin. We got to yes. catch up and we got to hang out and party a little bit and learn about each other. And uh, I got to see some of these methods that you use that we're going to briefly share about further on in this, uh, this episode. But I know that, uh, you know, I, I know several attorneys. I know several lawyers that are kind of in this Amazon e-com space. And none of you probably thought that you would be in the Amazon e-com space when you finished up law school. But uh, briefly tell us kind of your history, how you landed, where you are now. I know that you got involved in some marketing and some stuff right out of law school. Yeah. So when I graduated law school, I, I pretty much decided I didn't want to work for anybody else, <laughs> which is a hard thing to do as a recent law school graduate, because the question is, how are you going to get clients? So what I did is I launched, an inve- I launched a magazine for inventors. So it was all kinds of interesting ideas and content and articles about inventing and patenting. And I advertised my law firm in that magazine as well. So you could say, I guess I was doing content marketing in the 90s in print. And uh, so I've always had a love for marketing. I've always been hanging around in marketing groups and marketing my practice. And um, one of my marketing friends, actually Steve Simonson again, invited me to speak at his mastermind group. And when I did, I realized that people in e-commerce, Amazon sellers, really needed help when it came to patents. And so I've paid special attention to this area, and I've been invited to speak at a lot of different events in in e-com and for Amazon sellers. And um, it's been a great niche for me. I really enjoy the the people in this field. So how long have you been in the e-com niche now officially? Uh, Speaking, you know, the end of 2019, how long have you been in it? say about three years at this point. Oh, wow. That's, that's yeah. pretty lengthy. So you've seen a lot. You've probably experienced a lot um, and probably learned some really good, valuable lessons you can share with us. Absolutely. All right. So give us kind of the rundown on some of the biggest mistakes that e-commerce sellers make. I know you get you know, hired by a lot, of, uh, a lot of e-commerce sellers, specifically Amazon sellers, to protect themselves or to, to fix a big screw up they had. Tell us some of the most common ones that you see and how to avoid that. And let's also split that up. Like, let's split that up in maybe two different uh, directions. One is like, how do we as e-commerce sellers protect ourselves? When do we need to protect ourselves? How do we go about that? And then let's talk about how do we not screw up and infringe on somebody else's IP? Okay, great. That sounds amazing. So let's. Um, so first of all, I say the biggest mistake that Amazon sellers make is by underestimating the value of knowing about IP to their business. I think it's probably the thing that Amazon sellers tend to know the least about that's actually most important to their business. 
I mean, I think Amazon sellers tend to know a little bit about all the important things like, uh, like uh, packaging and shipping and PPC and not necessarily experts in every area, but they know a good amount. But when it comes to patents and, and, and uh, IP, they know the least, but yet this is something that could have a bigger impact on the business than any of those areas. Yep. So that's probably the, the biggest mistake that they make is by underestimating the value of, of learning more about this and the value that would have to their business. So, uh, so, so what areas of IP do you think people should be focusing more on? Like, I know IP is a huge topic, a huge topic. So let's say as an intermediate Amazon seller, right? Like, what do you think we need to be focusing the most on? And I'll tell you this, the, the topics that I see most often discussed are just trademarks just to get brand registry, right? And, and I know that that's a hot topic to unlock that kind of golden feature of Amazon. But, you know, how important really is it to have trademarks for our business, not just our Amazon account? And then what other types of IP should we be uh, looking at getting to protect ourselves? Yeah, well, trademarks are very important to your business, especially the Amazon business, and it, it's the key to brand registry. Um, and also, I mean, I would just say that trademarks are a no-brainer. Uh, you know, patents, it's debatable how deep you want to get into it. It depends on what type of products you're, you're selling and how innovative your products are, et cetera. But trademarks are a no-brainer. You just need to handle it. You can't push it aside. I mean, I think traditionally, a lot of entrepreneurs avoid trademarks because when they think of trademarks, they think of that $100,000 problem when somebody says you're infringing my trademark. And they're kind of like, well, let's just put that off as long as we possibly can. But when it comes down to it, getting your trademarks, uh, getting trademark protection, it costs just a couple thousand dollars. And when you do it now, it avoids that $100,000 problem later on. So there's a, there's a couple different types of trademarks too. Um, One is and I don't know the specific industry terms, but one is like your name or your your text or whatever. And then there's the actual mark, right? Like the actual design. And, and right now we're talking mostly about logos. Can you explain the difference between those two? And I'll tell you where I screwed up and the way I know there's a difference is one of the first brands that I tried to trademark. I tried to trademark and I filed myself. I filed basically the name of this brand. And there wasn't another brand name the same, but it was it was compiled of words that were closely enough associated with each other that it was a little bit too generic. So after like nine months, they rejected it and I lost my money. And then I went, oh my gosh, you know, I wish I would have known that I could have just done basically the logo, the mark, and I would have been fine. So can you explain the difference? And uh, I basically told you everything I know about it. So the, so I right. just exhausted all of my uh, my expertise on that. So you have to take over it. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there is, there is a logo mark and a word mark. So word mark is when you're protecting the name or the phrase, which actually tends to be the most important. I mean, we could talk for a mo- in, in a moment about what might have went wrong in your situation. But, um, but generally, you want the word mark above all, all, above all, because that's protecting the name or the phrase, which people are most commonly looking for. The logo or the design mark is just protecting the logo or the look that you're using to stylize that name. And most of the time, uh, you would be most offended if someone took your name, not necessarily, and if they took your name and they used a different styling for it or a different logo for it, you'd still be offended. You'd, it would still hurt your business. So the, the word mark is what matters most. That's so what, if we're, yeah, so if we're thinking about brand names um, for our business, we need to try to come up with, and to, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm making a statement here and you can, you can correct me. We need to try to come up with a name that can be protected, not just the logo, because even if we come up with the logo and we call it, I don't know, Tim's Microphones is the brand name, right? Um, if we can't protect that, but I create a great logo, someone else theoretically could create a brand called Tim's Microphones with a different logo, but it'd be called the same. Is that right? Exactly. And that's why you want to protect the word mark. So, and then another thing I understand recently, and tell me if this is right, is that you can't just use a misspelling because the sound of the name, like anything that creates confusion, is also infringement. So if I said Tim's microphones, but I spelled it like T-I-M-Z and then misspelled the word microphones, but it, stout, it still sounded the same. If somebody else had already protected that, even if I spell it different, but it sounds the same, it still creates consumer confusion and it's still wrong. Is that right? 
Uh, yes. So uh, first of all, one of the foundation principles of trademarks is likelihood of confusion. When you okay. create a likelihood of confusion with another mark, <clears throat> then you're going to be infringing that mark. Um, and so there's a, there's a bit of common sense to it in figuring out where there's a likelihood of confusion. Where would consumers be confused? But yes, that's, a, that's an age-old principle of trademarks is that just changing the spelling isn't going to reduce the likelihood of confusion. Because when I talk about Coca-Cola, I'm not telling you whether it has a K or a C in it. I'm just saying Coca-Cola. So generally, changing the spelling is not going to change much about the trademark situation, whether you are infringing someone's mark or whether you have the ability to register it yourself. Changing the spelling isn't going to make much difference. Gotcha. So for all intents and purposes, if an Amazon seller wants to get brand registry and they can't come up with a super creative name, all they should do is make sure that the name they have isn't currently protected. So it could be Tim's Microphones. Create a unique logo, get the trademark on the logo itself, and it unlocks me to brand registry. But it doesn't really protect my business or my actual brand. Is that right? Well, In a nutshell? If you get the, um, I mean, to follow your example, you're saying if you're able to get the registered mark, um, yes. I guess I'm not seeing what, why it wouldn't protect your. Yeah, business. not the name mark, the logo mark. Oh, the logo mark. Yeah, so the logo mark yeah. is easier to get, but it has less protection, but it still gets us brand registry and all that good stuff. But if well, we want okay. to be thinking beyond that, we need to actually work on the name mark also. Um, here's the thing. And, and this is where, you know, it's hard to predict what Amazon is going to do. And they're all over the place. Yeah. Um, in general... Uh, if you asked me last year, I would have sworn a stack of Bibles that you can't get brand registry with a logo mark. And it just makes sense because um, Amazon doesn't care about the logos. They want, if you want to prevent someone from using that name, you should have protection for that name. Then they would be rightfully stopping other people from using that. So, so they hadn't been affording people brand registry for a logo mark. But I've anecdotally heard from people that they've gotten brand registry from a logo mark. And I can't confirm or deny that. Um, or I haven't been able to verify that, I should say. I can so absolutely can tell, tell you you can. Yeah, Within the well, last year, I've... And, I, and, yeah, and, I've, and again, yeah. it's one of those things that just doesn't make sense because they shouldn't. Um, yeah. It doesn't make sense to give someone exclusive domain over a name just because they've registered the logo. But if they are, then I guess they are. Um, yeah. But, but then, yes, I guess to follow your example, if you can get brand registry by registering the logo, it's still not protecting your business. It's still not preventing other people from using that name in commerce. Yeah. And one thing that I see so commonly among Amazon sellers is we think that Amazon is our business and that our business is Amazon, and it's not. So the rules that apply to Amazon, such as they'll accept this and they'll protect this, it might not actually protect us or apply the same way in real life. Exactly. Um, I know uh, you and I recently, uh, last time we were together, I was showing you a product that we looked at with a patent and, um, you know, we were trying to figure out, is this actually patented? And, you know, Amazon doesn't care if there's a patent number basically stuck on a listing, Amazon says you're infringing. But just because Amazon makes that decision doesn't necessarily mean that a court would or that, you know, it actually is infringing. So, you exactly. know, all of you, all of you listeners keep Keep in mind that Amazon does not always play by the same rules as the USPTO. What applies for Amazon might not apply in real life. Exactly. Uh, or I you have, can say they don't always do things that are logical or fair. <laughs> we all agree with that. <laughs> we can all agree with that. And there, there's absolutely no reason why we should be thinking small. You know, a lot of us think of ourselves as Amazon sellers. And I tell everybody, don't be an Amazon seller. Be a product seller that sells on Amazon. So think bigger. Think, hey, in two or three years, I may be selling on different platforms. And yeah. just because we got some protection on Amazon this year doesn't mean that same protection is going to hold up for us in two or three years on a different platform or somewhere else. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that for a moment if I can. Um, and yeah. so a lot of people talk about, well, how do I grow outside of Amazon? Like, what's the key to moving to other platforms, moving to Shopify-based websites, et cetera? And in my view, IP is the key. Because if you're successful on Amazon, um, one of the leverage points to getting to be successful on other platforms is if you have the branding. Um, it's if you have IP protection for the products, in other words, patents. So IP can be the leverage that you, that you need to grow successfully on other platforms because it's what creates your niche for your products, for your branding. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So we've talked a little bit about uh, protecting ourselves. What about the difference in patents? I know that there are utility patents or design patents. Can you give us kind of the five minute rundown as Amazon sellers? What do we need to know about patents? Understanding that most of the products, private label products that we sell probably cannot be patented, but um, we need to be aware that we might be able to find product opportunities that can be and that, uh, you know, we kind of need to have the basic understanding of that. Okay, great. So, um, so first of all, yes, there's a utility patent, and a utility patent is what we, we're typically thinking of when we think of a patent. You think of something that someone creates in their garage, and it's um, an improved, whatchamacallit, and it operates in a way that overcomes some problems that other people have experienced. So a utility patent protects the functional differences in a product. You have something structurally different about it, and it's for a functional reason. That's what a utility patent is for. It's for what we most typically think of as an invention. A design patent, on the other hand, is for just the, the physical configuration, the physical look of the product. So it's like the shape of an Evian bottle or a Poland Springs bottle. That could be the subject matter for a design patent or the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle. So it's just for the shape or the look of the product. And that's all it's protecting. And I'd say those are the two main categories. Um, one thing that's interesting about Amazon is that traditionally we would have thought that utility patents are better because they cover more of a concept, but design patents actually are better on Amazon because they tend to more easily shut down products when the product looks the same. Now, you would have typically thought that a design patent isn't that valuable because if it's just protecting the appearance, you change the appearance and you're not infringing the patent. But you know, first of all, when people copy your product on Amazon, they don't get imaginative about it. They just copy the exact product. Yeah, so or they're healthy. usually contacting the same factory who's not changing anything. Exactly. They're probably using your molds. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so for Amazon, so just, just correct me if I'm wrong. In real life, a utility patent is stronger, right? Yes. But a utility patent is also harder to achieve because you have to have something very unique in build, function, use, whatever, right? A design patent is a little bit easier to get, as yes. assuming that it is uh, original. You know, we can't just take something that 50 other people have and try to get a patent on it. Um, and on Amazon, most people are, uh, what's the, I won't say lazy enough, but maybe not creative enough that we can usually hold them off with just a design patent. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And, um, and when it comes to utility patent, it is more difficult to get, but I'd say more accurately, it's more difficult to get a good utility patent because you see a utility patent will only be as broad as your invention is new. So you invent a stapler with some like little novel feature to it. You, you can get a utility patent, but it's only on that little novel feature, that release lever or whatever it is. And so um, for someone to infringe, they have to copy that feature. Now, um, if that feature matters to your competitors and matters to your customers such that they want it with that release lever or whatever you're patenting, then that's great. That's a valuable utility patent. But most of the time, I see people getting utility patents that are very specific. And it's not about, it's about details that your competitors don't care about copying because yeah. they don't need to. So that's the other thing to, to, to know is if you're going to get a utility patent, you want it to be one that's on something that matters to your market, matters to your customers, matters to your competitors. Um, Got it. And I think that the, the one other thing that I think people need to know about patents, if you're a seller, is that if you ever want to patent something, you need to do it at an early stage. You really need to do it before you launch the product or worst case within a year of launching the product. Because beyond that, it's absolutely too late to ever get a patent. Yeah. So we've talked about, you know, if we have a product, how to protect ourselves, but a lot of us are still looking for a product and it's very common for, you know, people to be cruising around Amazon looking for these product opportunities and they see one guy killing it with this product and they've got no competition. They're priced too high and they think, Hey, you know, I can compete with this guy, but how do we know if they're protected? All right. Um, you know, product opportunities that look too good to be true sometimes are. So we've got to do our due diligence, I understand. So if we're looking at, um, probably, probably it's safe to say, correct me if I'm wrong, that when we're looking at somebody else's product, we need to be looking more at the patent side than the trademark side, because as long as we change the name, you know, the product is just dependent on the patent, right? 
Yes, that's mostly true. I mean, there are rare cases where people have branding protection for a product for a certain color scheme when it's so well known and so distinctive for uh, certain aspects of the product that if you look at it, you would just know that that's, oh, that's a Disney product because of the styling of it or something like yeah. that. Um, but in general, yes, it is patents that we need to be concerned with. And it isn't easy to know when you're clear to make a product. It really is not easy. Um, even if you come to me and say, can you tell me, am I free to make this product? It could be a whole lot of legwork and can be very expensive to figure that out. But there are shortcuts. So first of all, if there's a, a patent number, you absolutely want to look up that patent number uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, patents expire. And once they expire, they're fair game. So if you look up that patent number and you see that it's expired, then you're free to make exactly that product if you want to. And when you say look it up, we should be able to just Google the patent number because Google has a really good database of USPTO content, right? Yes, you can Google the patent number or you can go to, the, to Google's patent search site, which is patents with an S, Dot google .com. So patents.google.com. You can look it up there. Um, also, pat utility patents expire early if the maintenance fees aren't paid. So you can go to the USPTO website and look it up to make sure that, they're, that they paid their fees. If they didn't pay their fees and it expired early, again, it's fair game. And um, uh, beyond those two tips, I mean, looking up to see if it's expired, um, it gets a little complicated and it gets a little difficult to interpret the patent and, and know what's covered by it. But there's a few shortcuts. And one of the shortcuts is the principle that whatever it is that they patented, it can't be whatever existed before they got their patent. So if you're looking at the thing and you see this patent for the stapler and you're like, I don't know what's protected by this patent. But then you, you look back and you see earlier examples of, of staplers. You see a stapler from 25 years ago that's basically identical except for that release lever. Then you know, well, if I want to make that stapler that existed 25 years ago, I can. Might not be able to make whatever is different about it. But you find examples of the product that existed 20, 25 years ago. You know there can't be a, an existing patent on it. And therefore... Uh, you can go ahead and make that thing that existed from a long time ago. And so most of the time when you're searching for products, it's not necessarily the exact product that you want to duplicate. It's that genre. It's that, yeah, like that's a cool thing. I'd, I'd love to make um, hooks to hang up my keys by the door. And, um, and you wonder, hey, does someone have a patent on, on a hook like this? Well, if you find an example of the genre from back then, then whatever you find from way back then, you can make exactly that. And, uh, and uh, no one could say anything about it because at best, it would be in an expired patent. Gotcha. All right. So I think we've covered how to protect ourselves from other people infringing, um, an idea of whether or not we're going to infringe on other people. And I'd also say, you know, most attorneys like yourself offer patent searches, right? So if I get on Google and I'm just not sure, I can hire someone like you that will do some due diligence for me and see if, see if I would potentially be infringing. And my understanding is that just having the patent search through uh, an actual law firm amounts me some sort of protection, right? Not really. I would say um, it's a very fine category, but, but maybe if you were infringing and, um, um, and you were in an infringement lawsuit and like when you got to the point where they have to figure out damages, they could increase the damages if they considered your infringement to be willful. And I guess you showing that you did some type of due diligence would reduce the damages, but I don't think we ever want to be in that situation anyway. No. So, um, and and I, I, I can't think that too many people even end up all the way down the road in that situation of, of figuring out whether the damages are willful or not. So um, in general, I think it, it pays to do the, the due diligence to keep you out of trouble. I yep. think you do the due diligence to reduce the risk. You can never really eliminate the risk, but a lot of times it pays to reduce the risk. And I would say the, the amount that you, the amount that it's worthwhile to spend on reducing the risk is proportionate to how much you're investing in the product. If you're launching a product and it's costing you like 
thousand, two thousand dollars to get it together and launch it. It's not worth spending a few thousand dollars on some due diligence. Yep. But if you're going to spend um, you know, four or five figures on launching the product, it, it pays to do a certain amount of due diligence to reduce the risk that you're wasting that money. Sure, absolutely. All right, so um, you understand the the digital marketing thing a little bit. You understand e-commerce. You understand patents. One of the things that that shocked me um, as far as new content, because I don't hear a ton of new content, but when we were down at Kevin King's event, is you spoke about using expired patents as a product research opportunity. And I'd like for you to give just kind of the short version of that, kind of help us understand a little bit of what that looks like. And I'll preface it by saying one of the most common things that people want to know is how to find product opportunities, right? And this whole Amazon game, it seems like everybody can outsource or knows how to do PPC and optimization and the listing photos and the this and that and the ranking. But what the crap do I sell? That's like one of the biggest difficulties and one of the hardest things that people, um, you know, have to wrap their minds around. So can you briefly tell us about this method and kind of how you came, came about figuring this out? Yeah, absolutely. And just echo- echoing what you said. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like ha- finding the product to sell. It's a matter of, uh, like you want to be original. You want to be different. You want to have something that's distinct, um, to justify jumping in there with a new product. And, um, those are hard to come by. But as it turns out, there's a whole gold mine of ideas that have been patented by someone who thought it was the greatest idea ever. Like, you know, these people put a lot of their time and, and resources into patenting it because they believed in this idea. It solved the problem for them. It was something which, uh, which they thought that other people would really want. Um, but they never commercialized it. And time went on and those patents expired. And this has been the case since the patent system began 200 years ago. So there is a wealth of patents. There's about 7 million expired U.S. patents, which were somebody's notion of a a fantastic idea, a great idea enough that they went to the trouble of patenting it. But most of these were never commercialized. When I say most, I mean, most usually means 51%. But now, in this case, I would say most means more like 90, 95%. Now, why do you think they were never commercialized? Do you think that some of them were ahead of their time? Some were just really crappy ideas? Like, what, what's the deal here? Well, it's a mixed bag. I would say some were ahead of their time, some were really crappy ideas. But there are also a lot of people that believe that myth that if you build a meta, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be, <laughs> I can't say it. If you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. And people believe that. People believe that if they went out and patented something that everyone would find them and say, hey, that's a great idea. Let's license it. Let's do this. But the truth yeah. is, is no one's going to find you. You have to find them. And as I'm sure all of your listeners know who are um, deep into their own businesses and e-commerce businesses that you've got to get that, get out there and, and put some effort into building that product and marketing it and listing it and, and um, you know, getting it out there for, for people to know it even exists. Yeah. So I'd say by far the biggest reason is that people didn't put the right effort into commercializing it. And a lot of those products, you know, were, were maybe, you know, developed or, or, or patented or whatever well before digital marketing and Amazon was possible. Um, one of the great stories uh, about that is like the fidget spinner. You know, that was patented years and years and years ago. And the lady just didn't know how to sell it. She didn't know how to market it. She didn't have the right audience. That patent expired. And now there's a bazillion of them out there. So just because it was a bad idea 20 years ago doesn't mean that it's a bad idea now. Is that correct? Right. Or that it just wasn't feasible 20 years ago because it's like you said, I mean, looking back 20 years ago and, and, and like, well, if you had an idea for a cool gardening product, it'd say, oh, let's see, what could I do? Maybe I could advertise in Home and Garden magazine. How much yeah. is a full page ad? Oh, you know, $20,000. Okay. Well, there's little classifieds you can take in the back, which is $50 per word. So for $1,000, I could place a 20 word ad. And that was like your path towards potentially launching a product. And most of the time that wasn't successful. Yeah. And, and you're right now with digital marketing and with the internet and, and the possibility of creating a listing f- with next to nothing. 
uh, there is a whole new playing field available for launching a product. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good stuff. So where would someone go to find these, these, Del- or these expired patents. Let's say I sit down and I decide I'm going to do product research today. What is right. like steps one, two, and three to start perusing these, you said over 7 million patents? All right. Well, the simple thing is you can go to Google patents and, uh, and you could type in any type of search. You could search for, um, you know, uh, toy cars or uh, any type of genre of product you could think of, gardening tools, and thousands of th- items will, will pop up. And then you want to limit it by um, the, um, uh, the filing date. So there's a field to the left. You could limit it by filing date and say for, um, um, filed before um, December 1999 if we were doing it today, which means 20 years earlier than today because utility patents expire 20 years after they were filed. So if you're looking for things then before 1999, then you've limited now to things which are expired, and then those are fair game. Um, But it's often hard to find precisely what you're looking for. There are more advanced searching techniques you could use to narrow it down further, but this will at least put you in the ballpark. You're looking for expired patents within your genre, and There are a lot of not so great ideas that you'll have to weed through, but there's gold in there. Um, I mean, I could think of my own clients who had really great ideas that didn't follow through on. Um, I mean, over the past uh, 25 years, I've gotten 2,000 patents for clients, and and there's you know there's many many patents in there that were fantastic ideas that they didn't follow through on, and then there's millions more from others. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, I didn't realize that you could uh, until I heard heard about your thing, you know, back in Austin, that you could actually sort by date and look at what was expired. So literally, those of you that are listening, I mean, millions of product opportunities out there just looking to be found. And until I met Rich, I'd never heard this stuff before. So this isn't mainstream information. There's not a lot of people talking about this. I think that this is wide open opportunities. And you guys know that I advocate for getting off of Amazon to find products to sell on Amazon. This is a, another great resource. And uh, I think it's I think it's awesome. And like, like uh, Rich was saying, these aren't usually just crappy ideas. They're probably pretty good ideas, or at least a lot of brain power was sunk into them because the investment was made to file the patent. And that's not cheap. It's not easy. It's not quick. So if someone went through that much effort. There must have been some sort of, you know, reasonable assurance that this is a good product. It just may have been bad timing. So thank you, Rich, for sharing that with us. That's really awesome information. And um, I'm sure that the viewers are glad to hear that. Those of you that are listening to this on YouTube or watching this on YouTube, post any questions that you have in the show or in the comments section, and we'll make sure that um, any question I can't answer, we'll get with Rich and we'll get that answered for you. Um, This is one of those topics that I'm definitely not an expert in, not a professional in. I don't have that cool little Esquire in the back of my name on the business card. So we'll make sure to get those answers from Rich so I don't misrepresent somehow. Okay, great. That, that sounds amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, for those of you that want to track down Rich, uh, Rich, where can they find you? Give us your uh, your website and uh, how can we get in touch with you? Uh, well, my website is goldsteinpatentlaw.com. And uh, there's some great information there. There's some great videos also that explain the patent process. And um, through the website, you can contact my office to see if it's a match for us to work together. Um, also, If you want to learn more about the process, uh, the American Bar Association asked me to write a book explaining in plain English how patents work for entrepreneurs. So I wrote the ABA Consumer Guide to Obtaining a Patent, which you could find on Amazon, and it's pretty inexpensive. And um, other than that, you see me at different events. Well, then don't you have a website for videos, patentvideos.com or something? I do. I have a, a series of six videos that's available for free that explains the process. That's at patentvideos.com. Patentvideos.com. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for being on. Um, any last words of wisdom to the e-commerce community in general? Anything random or exciting or, or anything you want to share before we sign off? Um, yeah, so I would say that, um, always look up a patent number if you see the product because too many people, uh, I I mean, look, it can go either way. Sometimes people will see a product with a patent and they'll just go right ahead and do it and get themselves into trouble. 
But a lot of people, they see a patent number on, the, on a product and they stop. And they might be giving up an opportunity too easily because it, they might not have a patent on what, what you think they'd have a patent on. Uh, so therefore, when you see a patent number on a product, always look it up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rich, for being on. Thank you for this information. Again, if any of you have any questions, you've got his uh, website information. You can track him down. If you need uh, to get a patent, if you need to, to look at getting some trademarks, make sure to check out Rich and his website. And uh, again, we have all those links in the show notes below here on the YouTube channel. Thank you all for listening again to another episode of Legion Radio. Like we said, track us down in our Facebook group, Private Label Legion, like the Facebook page, hickory-flats.com, privatelabellegion.com. And if any of you are out and about in this big world, look for me and Rich. We're both uh, kind of on the circuit, I would say worldwide, speaking at different events, going to meetups, networking events. Uh, we'd love to meet you, love to shake your hand, love to know uh, a little bit about what you're doing in your business, how you're doing and learn from you. So, all right, thank you all for being on and we'll see you on the next episode. You've just wrapped up another episode of Legion Radio, hosted by Tim Jordan. Past episodes, links, and show notes can be found at privatelabellegion.com.